Hello, and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. Just not always the same ones. Hey, you were going to say my line, Steve. I saw that. No, I there was that. there was there was like a long pause that you forgot <laughs> your your line that we've been doing for like a year and a half. No, I didn't. It must have been a delay. It must have been a delay. So I'm Danielle Sherry, and who are you? I'm I'm just the the guy in the sweater. <laughs> He's Steve Aiken. We're both from Fine Gardening Magazine, and today we have a very special guest who has appeared on our podcast multiple times before. Mystery guest, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Carol Collins. I'm the associate editor editor here at Fine Gardening. All right, so we have the we have the magnificent three today, and our topic is shrubs for shade. And not that we don't always invite Carol in, and we wouldn't love her to be on every episode, but we really needed her this time because, as listeners know, I have like 15 feet of shade, and that's about it. So if we're going to talk about shrubs for shade. I needed some backup. So Carol's my backup today to, to round out the plant list. Steve, how many shrubs for shade? You have quite a bit of shade in your yard, right? I do. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't have any real, I have a little bit of full sun and then the rest is just like varying degrees of shade and, and sun. So okay. um, I never have the conditions for the plant I'm trying to plant. So you just if, said you have all conditions. Well, yeah, I know, but like if I if I have a shade plant, I'm like, oh man, I have nowhere to put this. Like all, all my shade spots are full, you know. Or if I have a full sun plant, I'm like, where am I going to put this? I have to build a new bed, you know, and that kind of thing. I gotcha, Car- Carol. What about you? The conditions you you have some wooded areas, so I would assume that you've got some some good shady spots. Yes, so we have a stream that runs along our southeast border of our property, and that ha- is lined with mature trees, but like two years ago, three years ago now, um, like three of our giant oak trees blew down. So I have a lot less shade than I used to have. Oh, that presents a challenge too, because then yeah. you've got to like do the little shuffle of all the plants that are now burning in the, in the sun. <laughs> you know, I, I learned though that, that some of them are just fine with full sun. Right. So there you yeah. go. I've heard that too. I've heard that too, that it, that that is not a problem. I mean, when our trees fall, I feel like they, they basically fall into the yard. So I don't care. It, it hasn't really affected anything in our wooded area. But yeah, I um, 15 square feet of shade. So I, I have two shrubs to contribute. <laughs> That's about it um, to the conversation. But I think we're all going to we're all going to pick two of our favorites. And then we've got an expert guest too to round out the list today. Another expert guest. So who wants to kick us off? Hey, Carol, kick us off. Let's 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 uh, mix it up a bit. What have you got first for your first plant? So my first plant is um, is a Northeast native um, and it is American cranberry bush. That's Viburnum trilobum. It is hardy from zones two to nine. Two. It is very hardy. So uh, stop writing us zone two. We're giving you plants now. Knock it off. Look, look I, do, does zone yeah. two even write us? I mean, like, where is zone two? I think it's like the tundra. Oh, I was yeah. in northern Vermont and that was zone four. So yeah. um, zone two is like Canada. But, you know, they need plants too. And this one would mm-hmm. do the trick. Um, it's really, it's a sweet little plant. It grows 10 to fi- uh, 15 feet tall and wide. Um, it can take full sun, I learned, because it went from almost full day of shade to half a day of sun. And it's it's it actually got bigger and more vigorous. It's sort of got a nice vase shape. Um, I love its spring flowers. They're like a lace cap hydrangea kind of looking flower. And, and then later in the season, you get these little red berries. And people say the birds love them. They, they, they wait a while. So you get to enjoy them, and then later the birds eat them. That's a and, bonus because, you know, yeah. so many so many buried shrubs, you know, the birds come in in one foul swoop, and you're like, wow, I used to have a winter berry. Do, do I really have a winter berry? <laughs> right. um, yeah, and it's, it's leaves, leaves are kind of mapley, and it gets nice fall color, sort of reds and purples. Um, just a sweet shrub that takes, you know, takes a nice presence in the garden and mixes up your perennials. Um, I love it. I found it at a plant sale years ago, and, and it's been there ever since. Nice, nice. And you said Northeast native, right? Yeah, um, North American native. It's, it's got a, quite a large native range. 
Nice. Hey, Steve, was this the viburnum that uh, Andy Brand it, had talked about on our? That's that's what I was going to ask you because oh, I can't remember. Right. So so Andy Brand was talking about a uh, a native viburnum, um, and the what turned me off to that one was that it had kind of a loose, scraggly hab like an open habit. So it looked it looked kind of unkempt. Um, Carol, does your does your um, shrub have have like a loose open habit, or is it like a nice tight? Oh, I don't know. I would describe it as like fluffy. It's you know, okay. it's like yeah. Sort yeah. Of but takes if it, up it, space. if it weren't on the edge of the woods, if you pulled it into a garden, would it still look nice, or would it look kind of you know scruffy? I don't know. I think it looks nice all the time. Um, and there are cultivars that are more compact, if that's what you're looking for. So, and there are cultivars that have more berries and more flowers. Um, I have just the straight species. But I don't, I don't mind its habit at all. And I, mean, I think it, it looks good with littler things, and it looks good with bigger things. It's sort of your intermediate size. Shape. It feels like they shaped with a fluffy habit. I mean, it's it, it sounds like a good candidate for underplanting. You know, if you did move it into a border, that it would it would be something that would allow you to really get you know maybe some nice like mounding two footers, three footers underneath it, yeah. and really maybe hide some of the what did you call it, Steve? Scraggly, <laughs> maybe it's scraggly. It's stems. It's it's legs. Yes, you know, I, I, we might we might have two different shrubs here, but I remember I think uh, Andy, so. Andy Brand say, saying that as uh, the one he was talking about, as it spread, it, like it, it didn't stay kind of tight; it kind of it's formed like a loose yeah. colony, um, and that was that's what made me go, eh, no. But you know, uh, American cranberry bush, yeah, I got to put that on my list uh, yeah, of, of things yeah. that you know, I, I, my long, long list of things that I, I need to grow. <laughs> Well, let's see what's something on your list that you've already planted that you can help us out with the uh, the the topic of the day. Well, uh, I'm going to you notice that I did not email my list to you and Carol in advance. No, but I, yeah. I snuck into the folder to see what you were going to talk about. Uh, see, see, I didn't I didn't I wanted an honest reaction to this plant because this is a plant that I kind of have. But it's more I keep thinking about it more and more. And I keep wondering, why am I not growing this? Mm -hmm. uh, because there is, uh, let, let's let's face it, there's there's a stigma attached to growing this plant. Um, oh, there's you you are um, you're judged if you if you put this this plant in your garden, and uh, at least around here, at least in the Northeast. Um, Carol, get your rotten tomatoes ready. See, I can't wait. <laughs> see, like what is wrong with azaleas? Mm. Why, why they are never part of the conversation. They're always a thing that you walk past in the nursery to get to the more interesting stuff. But, you know, I think azaleas are great. And every time I see them in, well, some azaleas are great. Okay. Let's say there are some bad ones in the bunch. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's not azalea's fault. We shouldn't not grow azaleas because there are some neon orange, you know, um, hey. And really bizarre colors and things like that, you know, out there. Like it's some of the colors are a little bizarre and a little gaudy, and the way that they've been used and the ubiquitousness uh, can kind of turn you off. But that's not the fault of the plant. You can add this uh, an azalea to your garden and, and have it add wonderful things. It blooms like crazy in spring, mm -hmm. and in fact, it's the, the the blooming of the azaleas is one of the signs of spring, like a daffodil, you know, or a red bud. Um, but for some reason, there's a stigma attached to azaleas. And I'm here to end that stigma. I'm here for <laughs> azalea rights. You know, it's time to bring them back into the gardens of real gardeners and not just in, in you know, in parking lots and in, the, you know, the gardens of people who don't know any better. You know, um, th th we need to plant these. And I love white azaleas. Mm. I don't know why. Uh, I was in a garden in Rhode Island years ago and his white azaleas were just popping. You know, and he had the, you know, dots of them all over the place. And, and I think that's what started my uh, reevaluation of this whole, you know, group of, of plants. Um, and then I just keep coming, stumbling upon more and more azaleas that I think like, well, that's a great plant. Why am I not growing it? Wow, that's a great plant. Why am I not growing it? That I saw one out in, um, in Seattle and it was, it was just a, 
a gorgeous uh, shrub growing in a pot with multicolored, uh, you know, like red and yellow leaves. Um, not in like a variegated, but it looked like a fall color to it. You know, like it had faded to red and yellow, but it wasn't fall. It was, and I forget the name of it. Um, probably should have looked it up. But you know, for 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 shade understory plantings, azaleas are wonderful. And yeah. it, it, if anybody is into golf, they watch the Masters tournament every spring. Woo! And part of the the wonder of watching the Masters is seeing all the azaleas in bloom, as you know. As the as the, the the men are hitting their little you know white ball around around the grass, you know, <laughs> um, it's it's the reason why I always stop you know to watch. Like my dad watches golf for golf. Um, I watch to see like oh what's what's blooming in the background, uh, and the azaleas are gorgeous. I mean they they are part of the vernacular of of the American South, mm-hmm. um, almost to the again to the point of ubiquitousness. But they're they're native. They're, uh, they're native to much of the eastern. Um, United States probably there are probably some uh, that are native to, to to Western America too. So I don't I don't understand what the problem is. I mean, so this is uh, partial shade. Um, it kind of uh, they have shallow roots, so they don't like root competition. They can get to be one to four feet tall. They're usually deciduous. You can find some that are evergreen. You know, mm-hmm. um, acidic soil, just well drained. If you keep them watered and mulched, they should be okay. Um, they they now have the encore azaleas out, which bloom twice. Yeah. Like, oh, they're great in spring, but then forget it. No, they bloom in spring and fall. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I, I just I just think azaleas have have an undeserved bad rap because of some bad colors and because they've been overused. So I, think, I, I, I do hereby give everyone permission to go out and plant azaleas and buy I me think, one while you're at it. I think big box stores ruined azaleas. I really do. The early 80s when, you know, there was the massive boom of big box stores that really became like everybody's DIY go to. And then it was also the housing boom of these cookie cutter, you know, uh, suburban lots that were being built. The builders would go to Home Depot, I swear, and they would buy azaleas and dwarf Alberta spruces. And that's what they would chuck into the front landscapes of 99% of these new homes that were created for the housing boom. And if that didn't happen, then the homeowner moved into the house with zero in place for a garden and went to Home Depot, sorry, Home Depot or Lowe's or any of these box stores and picked up azaleas and dwarf Alberta spruces and chucked them in. And they weren't in the right conditions and they weren't sited correctly and they looked terrible. They look like these yeah. puny little sickly things that were in the front. And, you know, I, I feel like that's what ruined azaleas for the, 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 the greater public. But, but we are discerning gardeners. We know how to use plants right. Mm-hmm. So I mean, we should we, we we are above this. I also think part of it is that um, I, I think part of it is that, um, oh, it's spring, honey. We need to go buy some plants for the house. And you go to the nursery and boom, there are the azaleas in in bloom. And and oh, lovely. Let's bring these home and you bring them home. And like so that's how you, you get them. Um, and the, there's that. And then people buy them in all their, their numerous colors. So you get all these splotches of color. It looks like, you know, a plaid yeah, landscape. Hey. And like, that's a, that's a, that's a downside. Why um, are you picking on the orange one? That's Gibraltar. I actually have that no, no, in, no, no, no. in the woods. It's beautiful. Like it's a gorgeous orangey yellow color and it blooms like right after the forsythia. It's really beautiful. No, this, uh, my neighbor uh, has one that is like electric orange. Um, oh. And it's, it's bizarre. Like I'll be driving down the street and almost crash because I've never even noticed this person's house before. But then like one spring, there's this bizarre orange. It's not like a nice orange yellow. It's like a searing orange, like it got too close to to the sun kind of orange, you know, and it's just, you know, it's just like in your face. I'm like, oh, oh no, no, you could have done so much better with that. Um, yeah. And, and I don't think I don't think like like a harsh bright orange is, is the right color for spring, you know? Yeah, so, so there, there, there's, there's that, there's some, there's some bizarre, you know, neon magenta shades or some really gaudy pink ones out there, but mm-hmm. there's some wonderful, you know, uh, like I said, I love the white ones. There's some soft pinks out there, some wonderful reds, you know? Um, so I, I hate to throw out all these good plants because um, so many of them have been, you know, poorly used, 
uh, or come come in weird colors, you know. Carol, do you have any azaleas? I do, and I inherited them, so I don't know the names of them, except one had an old, old metal tag that was like, you know, sort of grown into its oldest stem, and it said Allegheny Mountain. And I think it was collected from the wild back in the day when people did such things. But it's white, and it's it's just a sweet little thing. I love it. Right. They're hard to move. See? They're uh. hard to move. Yeah, yeah. Because their roots are all in the top layer of soil. But mm. other than that, I love it. We should have yeah. Carol on more often. Right. Oh, oh, why? Because <laughs> she agrees with back. you? <laughs> no, I just, it, was just, it was just a thought that crossed my mind when she agreed with me. That <laughs> I will say we, we mentioned the masters, but another great place to see uh, azaleas in their glory is the Astaku Azalea Gardens, which are in Maine. Um, they're just outside of Bar Harbor, Maine, and that is a sight to behold. Um, so I'll just throw that out there. If you if you think that you don't like azaleas and you don't want to watch the masters, visit that garden in spring. It is truly inspiring. Um, OK, so my first shrub of my only two shrubs that I grow in shade uh, is an Inkyanthus, is showy lantern Inkyanthus. Um, I love Inkyanthus. I used to it, I used to order it into the nurseries when I when I worked for various nurseries, and it would be the plant that my boss would always say, "Why the heck did you order this? This thing is going to sit here and never sell." So I took it upon myself to sell as many Inkyanthus as possible because it's such an awesome shrub. It's um, zones four to seven, so it gives you a fairly decent range for for cooler locations does partial shade, has a very interesting, I, I picked two shrubs that are, I'm going to call them Laurel and Hardy. And um, whichever was the skinny guy, this is the skinny guy version shrub, because it only gets six to, it gets six to 10 feet tall, but only about four feet wide. So it's very skinny, narrow exclamation point that kind of vases out at the, at the, uh, at the top. Um, and then it has these stems that are kind of, um, I don't know, it, it has a little bit of a pagoda dogwood thing. So you kind of get this layering, this chandeliering effect to it. And in May and June, it's. I'm going to say it. It's like a blueberry on steroids because you get those beautiful pendulous blossoms, which in this case are clustered kind of on these little dainty strings. But those pendulous blossoms on the showy lantern are a bright reddish pink with a little bit of creamy yellow veining to them. It's truly spectacular. The pollinators go nuts. I love watching the bees try and shove their little fat bodies into those little teeny tiny bells. It's hilarious. It, it gives you such joy and it's a lot of entertainment. So it's obviously a pollinator magnet. Um, the other cool thing about it is it's got these palmate leaves that almost give it kind of a tropical look to it. You think, oh, is this shrub belongs in Florida. And those leaves turn bright, bright, bright scarlet in fall. So, you know, we talk about, you know, multi-seasons of interest. This thing has multi-seasons of interest. It's, uh, I've only ever grown it in partial shade. It prefers well-drained soil. It will take a little bit more moisture. It needs a little bit of acid, acidic soil to um, make it truly, truly happy, much like um, blueberries do. But yeah, I'm just, um, I'm a big, big fan. In previous gardens, I've grown different varieties of Inchianthus before. There's just straight Inchianthus um, campanulatus, which is just a straight species. It's still lovely. The blooms are more on the um, yellowish white phase to it though. Um, so big, big fan. That showy lantern Inchianthus. Anybody growing Inchianthus? Other than now, me. I want it. <laughs> that that's probably the shrub that's been on my uh, wanted list for like the longest time. Really? Um, but but I, I I can never I can never pull the trigger on it. I don't know why. Um, but I, I first, uh, you know, I became aware of it working at Fine Gardening. You know, and and then um, you know, plants in pictures in a magazine look a lot different, you know, when you see them in person. And True. then I, I basically walked right into one when I was at um, uh, Blythewold in, in Rhode Island. Um, I'm like, oh, that's an Enchianthus and look at that. But yeah, it, it reminds me of a cross between a blueberry and a mountain laurel. 
Yeah, because yeah. the, the foliage, the foliage for me uh, reminds me of a mountain laurel, um, and and then like I said, the flowers look like uh, blueberries. Um, but I always, I always, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the fall color because I was worried that it was going to be one of those shrubs that is cool in spring, but then in summer and fall, and what you get, you get, you get nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, like a dutzia, you know, or something like that. Yeah, um, no. But cool, but cooler. Um, so no, yeah, fall, I'm, I'm fall, glad you're with fall color. Yeah, that fall color. I say like the coloring rivals an itia. Like it is that intense red when it when it finally makes its transition into fall. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a winner. All right, so we're back around again, and Carol, help me out. Give me another shrub here that that I might need to make space for in my scant 15 feet of shade okay so this is not what i grow myself but you know how it's a it's a a bit of a um a problem when you're an editor at fine gardening and you go into these gardens and you see a plant that you just absolutely have to have and it happens in every garden (laughs) sure (laughs) does sure does right you're just filled you're just overcome with longing for this plant and I thought if I talk about this plant, then maybe I will actually go ahead and buy it. So (laughs) you're manifesting it out into the universe. (laughs) This is a plant that I uh, came across in our uh, cover story garden from 198, issue 198. It is high noon tree peony, um, Paonia suffruticosa. Thank you, pronunciation guide. I I actually (laughs) had to look that up. it's, it's hardy from zones four to nine. The place I saw it growing was in Toronto, Canada, which has got a very similar climate to ours. Um, some sources say that it's hardy from four to seven south and four to nine west. So I think people that are in the deep south can't grow this, but um, tree peonies are not trees. Uh, they're actually a shrub. And it's, so it's like a woody, um, it's got real presence, but the flowers, oh my gosh, I saw this thing in full bloom. It's got these just gorgeous, like glowing yellow flowers. Um, And each petal has a little red flare at the base. And the older it gets, the more flowers it makes. Um, And some people (laughs) report that it reblooms. So it's not just a you know, June type of show, but that it might actually throw a new bloom or two during the summer. Um, It it stays small. It only, it gets four to five feet tall, three to four feet wide. Um, It takes full sun to partial shade. And uh, Mary Gore's garden in that spot, I think it gets morning sun and then it's got protection from the afternoon sun. Um, Deer resistant. Um, the only downside is that it really likes evenly moist soil. So I would have to water cause I have sandy soil and anything that needs regular moisture. I got to be out there every other day. I think this plant might be worth it. It, it seems like a, a treasure plant, you know, like yeah. you have those, those plants that are just, first of all, probably a little pricey cause tree and peonies can be a little pricey. So that would be definitely, it's the treasure plant. It deserves it, the love and attention and care it might need to, to do its thing. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know anyone who's seen a tree peony in bloom and not been in awe. Um, and, and if you have, then you probably, you know, have no soul or something like that. I don't know. Um, but the, to me, the, the big knock against that is what you said. It's the price. I mean, you're talking 90 to a hundred dollars or, or more for, for these uh, because they're so slow growing, I think is, is the, is the reason. Um, but I wonder why we don't see more because they're an investment. We all invest in specimen plants and like a really cool tree, but what, what provides more joy than a tree peony? Um, mm. But that, that's one reason why I love the Ito peonies, which are a cross between a tree peony and the herbaceous peonies. So you get kind of the tree peony flowers um, w- but they bloom like faster. They don't have to be so old to, to start blooming. Um, so, but, and, and the cost is in between an herbaceous peony and a tree peony, you know, it's expensive, you know, but not as much as a tree peony, but it's more than a, a regular peony, but yeah, yeah. tree peonies. I want, I want five of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every color. I think I get it in my head that, you know, that they're perennials. So I feel like I have that mental hurdle to get over that I don't mind spending 
on a, you know, a specimen tree in the hundred hundreds, but then I have to wrap my head around. It's not a perennial, like, come on day. It's not a perennial. Yes. It might be sold in a two gallon pot and in the perennial section, but it's not, it's a, it's, it's a tree. You should spend the same amount of money that you would on a tree on this. But I, I think I can't just, I, I can't get over that mental hurdle. They, they, they also have like that mounded shape you know, of the foliage that for some reason always reminds me of those, those weird cartoons from like, you know, 1970 um, where the people were dressed up in costumes. Um, It wasn't a cartoon. God, I can't think of it now. I can picture it, you know, uh, like in my nightmares, Uh, but, (laughs) but I I can't think of the name. Like there was, there was a witch, you know, and there's this weird little round uh, orange dude running around. So there was like regular people. And then there were people in costumes um, oh God, it was so bizarre. It was the type of thing that you would see in 1970, um, you know, and would, would give you Help nightmares as a child. Carol. Help me out. I don't know which character he's thinking this tree peony is. <laughs> That's what I it's, it's, it, well, you know, you know, like the characters from the old, um, McDonald's commercials, like Grimace and, yes. you know, and so, yes. so it was like people in costumes like that. Um, oh, and, and, and after, after the show, I'm going to email you guys a link cause I'm going to, figure it out but but right now i can't remember the name of it and it's driving me bonkers they were always in caves there's like two kids you know the cave and there's a witch and i don't know the 70s were weird yeah i think i was lucky i didn't have tv in the 70s so i I missed out obviously (laughs) i wasn't born so i definitely was lucky (laughs) oh my god all right steve Steve, is your next shrub like a character from the seventies? Uh, no, I'm trying. I'm trying to go to a happy place here to to just shed those <laughs> those weird uh, memories. Um, but my favorite, my all time favorite shrub for shade, um, partial shade, we should say, or high shade. Mm. I would, you know, if it's a bright shade, like mm-hmm. um, like from from tall trees, you know, uh, or partial shade, and that it gets some sun. Um, is is uh, a plant with a terrible name, which is Father Gilla, um, which sounds like a character from some weird nineteen seventies <laughs> show. Uh, but it's it's Father Gilla, uh, and, and I prefer the dwarf one, Father Gilla gardenii. It's not dwarf, but it's just the smaller one. Um, uh, there's Father Gilla major, which is much taller. Father Gilla gardenii is only going to get three to four feet tall. Uh, grows in zones five to eight. Um, it is an eastern native i think i would say um i think like pennsylvania as far north as the as the northern range goes maybe north carolina no north carolina and that whole region is where it's native to um uh, does great in, in high shade um and it has these wonderful uh, little round leaves with scalloped edges that for some reason remind me of potato chips um do not eat them uh, but they they make me happy because they remind me of potato chips, and I love potato chips, obviously. Um, and so, you know, handsome foliage. Um, and before that foliage comes out in spring, it has these wonderful white uh, bottle brush flowers, maybe like an inch or two tall, um, with like uh, I think the buds are kind of yellow, and then when it opens, it's it turns white, so it has like a white yellow thing going on. Uh, so a beautiful, uh, wonderful um, display in spring. Handsome foliage. Um, that you can find cultivars that have like a bluish cast to it, which is really wonderful. Uh, it, it's understated, um, but it has personality to it. And then in fall, you get amazing fall color from this um, yellow, red, orange, you know, and it's just, it's just a wonderful, easy to grow, undemanding um, native shrub. Um, I, I just love everything about it because it's, it's, it's showy without being gaudy. You know, and then, you know, it's understated. But if you look at it, it's kind of cool. Give it a little tension, you know, um, you'll, you'll fall in love with it. Uh, it's just it's just a wonderful, easy growing shrub. Um, I do have to say that when we uh, had a gypsy moth problem a few years ago, um, they they attacked the shrub and I figured the shrub was a goner. That's it. I shed a tear. Um, and then after the gypsy moths, you know, disappeared for the year, it leafed right back out. So, and still growing, growing strong. Uh, go do, ahead. Do you know, if, is, is Father Gilla in the, uh, in the witch hazel family? Cause those leaves yes. look so much like a witch hazel. Okay. They, yeah. They look exactly like a witch hazel and the gypsy moths attacked my witch hazel too. Um, yeah. They, they, ditto, they, they, and that's devoured what... it. 
Yeah. So anything yeah, in, the, in the witch hazel family. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just just a wonderful little shrub. Like if, if you grow this, it was just like a happy, agreeable, easygoing, you know, little guy in your garden. And you just, you'll just always be happy to see him. At least that's what, I think- how I react to it. I've been pining over the, you mentioned one with the blue cast, is Blue Shadow, is that the cultivar name or something? There's, there's one called Blue Shadow, there's one called Blue Mist. Um, okay. They're, they're coming out. Pining. Yeah, there's, um, there's, um, there's a new one out called Legends of the Fall, which they're really mm-hmm. playing up, it's, it's, um, it's fall color. And then I think there's, there's a dwarf one of that, which I think they call Legends of the Small. But I might just, <laughs> I might be dreaming that. Um, that just might be the way that it, that it went in my head. Um, do you recall this? Because that, that one's, that one's a new one. These are new ones and you do the new plant things. Have so, you seen these come across your. Yeah, yeah. Legends of the Fall we featured, I don't know, yeah. like maybe last year or so, because it is, it's, it's big claim to fame is that it takes that fall color and it amps it up even more, but it's larger. It's a larger Fallagilla. So I'm not sure. I haven't heard anything about Legends of the Small, but that's hilarious. I think you should reach out to, uh, proven winners color choice and and if they haven't figured that out yet you got something steve you might be yeah. getting royalties off that all right <laughs> I'd, I'd like I'd, I'd like to announce my retirement there you go yeah. there you go um all right so i'll i'll throw in for my my last shrub our last shrub here before we kick it over to uh our our expert testimony or actually peter probably has something to weigh in on this topic but i'm gonna do paper bush edgeworthia uh chrysantha which i shouldn't be able to grow and it's been a struggle uh this is zone seven to ten this is a, a shrub that I mean, I said Inkyanthus kind of looks tropical. This shrub definitely looks like it belongs in Costa Rica. Um, And I am very much not a zone seven. I am a zone six technically on paper. And I really think because of my elevation, I am more like a 5B. So I have this on the backside of my house. It's in a protected area that's actually protected on three sides. Um, I still struggle with it. It has really, really good years where it does super well for me and is beautiful. And then we will get an exceptionally late uh, bout of cold weather and it knocks it back all the way to the ground and I have to cut it back. And eventually it makes its way back into its glorious four foot by four foot self. Um, It's worth it, in my opinion. It's a deciduous shrub. It prefers partial shade to not dense shade, but a little bit more on the pure shade side. Um, it's on the north side of my house. It's really, really well. It likes moist, well-drained soil. Um, so there's that. You know, it's a little bit of a, a of a bummer there for a lot of us. The stems are fleshy, almost like a succulent. Um, really weird looking. They almost look like they have little suction cups up and down the stems. It's very interesting looking. Bright kind of silvery tan color to those stems. And so what it does is it puts on these beautiful little chandeliers of white silvery threaded um, buds. And they kind of dangle and hang on there from late fall all the way up and through the winter. And then right about now, it start in, you know, late February, early March, those little silver chandeliers burst open to these bright, bright yellow clusters of tiny, tiny tubular flowers. Um, they're kind of an umble shape, but they're upside down. Really stunning because you get the whole shrub is covered in these bright, bright, yellow chandeliers with no leaves on it. So it's interesting. And it blooms a little bit after the witch hazels too. So it kind of fills a little interest gap in my garden. Um, They're fragrant, extremely fragrant. You can smell them from, you know, yards and yards away. Um, More of a sweet uh, honeysuckle-ish fragrance to them. And then the leaves, after those flowers go by, then the leaves emerge and there are these long lance-like leaves that are a bright, bright green with a little silver veining to them. And it kind of makes this almost, um, I don't know, weeping Japanese maple uh, habit to it. Really, really interesting. 
super, super beautiful. Um, there's all sorts of cultivars of paper bush. Um, there's a red one called Red Dragon that was at the Northwest Flower and Garden Show many years ago. And now I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I still dream about that plant. Um, there's one that's called Winter Gold that's supposedly a little bit hardier than the straight up species of Edgeworthia. Um, so this is my zone buster plant. Uh, I have a few zone buster plants in my garden and this one is, uh, is one that it, it's worth it. I, I, and I don't know why, but it's the one I'm like, I'm willing to baby cause it's just so stinking cool. Um, yeah, which I probably shouldn't, but I do. It's where my effort is going. I, Edgeworthy is one of those plants that if you can grow it, you, you should, um, <laughs> for all of the wonderful qualities, um, you listed the thing, the thing I don't like about it is that, you know, uh, any, anybody I know who, who gardens, you know, in the South, like, you know, Maryland or below is always you know, around February or, or March. You said, oh, oh, I do declare my, my Edgeworthia seems to have uh, emerged into bloom with just the most wonderful <laughs> aroma. Why, Steve, have yours started to bloom yet? And I, I, I can't grow those, you know, um, I really want to, but I can't. Oh my, y'all are just missing out on just the most, I know I'm missing out on the most wonderful show. Okay, you guys can grow it, embrace it. Um, you know, I can't. Although, uh, my eyebrows raised when you mentioned a hardier cultivar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that, it, I think it's winter gold and I think it's zone six. It's a solid, it's marked as a solid zone six. Um, but I'm telling you, you know, I'm trying to make a go of it with the straight species. And if you've got a protected little nook, it's a, it's, it's worth a try. And, I, you know, it's going on nine years now in my garden. So it's seen it all. And I, I know that if I planted this, we would suddenly have like, you know, polar vortex, you know, of the year and have <laughs> a winter where it's just minus 10 for like the entire, you know, and it just doesn't have a, have a chance. But this thing grows in um, in, in Swarthmore. Carol, have you yes. ever seen it down at Swarthmore? Uh, I know you've been down to, to the, the Scott Arboretum down there and they have one down there. Um, and that's that's not too far south. Uh, it, it might be protected in the, you know, uh, surrounded by those stone buildings um, on campus there. But, uh, you know, seeing it, seeing it grow down in the Philly area gives me some hope. Yeah, they're not too far south of yeah. us. I think they do have a little bit milder climate, but yeah. not that much. Yeah, I, I used to live down there. And when when it would snow up here in Connecticut, it would, it would, it would be raining down in, in, in the Philly area. Um, but but not, you know, we're talking a couple of degrees here. It might not. Might not be. I should roll and the dice, all, but uh, you know, if we if all I can, have if, those microclimates, you know, if you saddle it up against the house a little bit more, um, and I will say it's been root hardy. So even in because mine was planted when we had the polar vortex, what was that four or five years ago? It it killed it all the way back down to the ground, but I chopped it back and it suckered back up again. So obviously it's 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 root hardy a little bit more so than than the zone seven designation. Do, do you have to protect it from deer? Do deer like it? No, because where it is, it's not really in the deer superhighway, which is the rest of my property. So uh, I haven't seen them latch on to this area, but I'm really lucky because my little corner of shade is steep embankment deck around corner with large shrub um so they it, it is kind of protected now that i said that you know it, there it's going to be mowed down next week but <laughs> knock on wood it isn't yet and now because everything sounds better with a british accent here's peter with his thoughts on shade sticking out shrubs for shade makes perfect sense many shade plants are low growing or fine textured so you need something to fill the gap between them and whatever large object is casting the shade. But what if you didn't fill that space? I submit that a shade garden should have gaps. After all, dense woodland isn't very appealing. Shade should be relaxing, where one goes for a quiet Sunday stroll, to find shelter from the sun, or to hide from some annoying guy with a podcast who keeps asking, Hey, Peter, what plant is this? While you're considering shrubs to add... Also consider adding a seat or a bench. Create a place to enjoy the stillness of the shade and enjoy the empty space where your imagination is free to roam. You know, I've been to Peter's garden and I've had a podcast and I've asked, you know, what these plants were, but uh, I didn't think it was all that annoying. I just wanted to know what the plants were. <laughs> 
Are you claiming that you're not annoying, Steve? No, I would never claim that. I think we should ask our expert in expert testimony whether or not you're annoying. Let's see what he has to say. Hi, I'm Andrew Bunting, Vice President of Public Horticulture at the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. Today, I'm going to talk about four great shrubs for the shade. The first one is a broad-leaved evergreen called Daphnophyllum macropodum. I like it because I can use it often as a substitute for the rhododendron. It has long strap-like leaves like most rhododendrons that are shiny. It has a petiole, which is the little stem that connects the leaf to the main stem that turns kind of a, a cherry red to pink. And then the buds are that same color. And while the flowers are somewhat inconspicuous, uh, the buds, especially in the summer, can be very attractive. It also will grow in extreme dry shade. So at the back of my property, I have a large specimen or specimens of the Norway spruce Picea abies, and they're quite old. And at the base of them, it can, it can rain an, an inch and still be quite dry at the base. But Daphnophyllum thrives in dry shade conditions, but it can also grow in quite a bit of sun as well. It's a multi-stem shrub, hardy to zone 6B or warmer. Also because of the alkaloids in the stem, it makes it almost essentially deer resistant. I've only seen a little bit of browsing in a location where there was extreme deer pressure. But other than that, in my yard, where is, I would say is reasonable deer pressure, uh, there is no damage. Daphnophyllum macropodum. The next shrub is called the wheel tree, Trochodendron aureoides. And like Daphnophyllum, it too will grow in dry shade. It has interesting kind of teardrop shaped serrated leaves that are glossy and an extreme dark green. And it grows in a somewhat kind of tiered or layered effect, which adds architecture to the garden. The flowers too are inconspicuous, but the foliage makes up for the flowers. It is also hardy to USDA zone uh, 6B or warmer, and can also be grown as either a multi-stem shrub or even a, a single trunked shrub that can ultimately grow into a small tree. My third choice is one of the Mahonias, and there's many different uh, Mahonias that are on the market. Uh, this is uh, Mahonia japonica, and in my area, and I, I live in southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, we can actually grow a, f a fair range of different Mahonias. We can grow some of the creeping types like uh, Mahonia repens or the Oregon grape holly, Mahonia aquifolium, and those are nice for kind of their ground covering effect. And then we can grow Mahonia bulei, and the Beals Mahonia for quite some time was a, a tough and rugged broad-leafed evergreen that people often grew in shady conditions. But one of its shortcomings is that it can seed around in the garden quite a bit. So it's showing up on some invasive plant lists. But there's one that has uh, similar attributes called the Japanese Mahonia, Mahonia japonica. And this has uh, a couple different seasons of interest. One, it has uh, very spiny leaves, hence the common name for some of the Mahonias, grape holly. Uh, so it has kind of this whirl of uh, pinnately compound leaves that each of the leaflet is um, uh, serrated and quite pointed at the margin. And then about this time of year in uh, late winter, early spring, through the center of the whorls of the leaves, you get this large spray of yellow flowers that also has uh, some fragrance. So it's a plant that kind of fills a niche in the garden whereby it flowers 
when the witch hazels are finishing and before say the winter hazels or the ornamental flowering cherries or even the earliest magnolias are, are starting. So depending on where you live, if you live more in southern parts of the United States, say southeastern United States or you know northern Florida or Texas or even California, it's probably going to be for you more winter flowering while in the, the mid-Atlantic and the northeast, and this is a, a zone 6B plant, will flower more end of winter, early spring. Uh, the last group I'd like to talk about is uh, kind of collectively some of the spice bushes. So in our woodlands around here, we have our, our native spice bush, uh, Lindira benzoin. And uh, the Lindiras are in the, the family Lauraceae, which is the same family as sassafras. And like sassafras, it has uh, fragrant stems and the chemicals that are in the stem make these plants truly deer resistant. So the native one, Lindira benzoin, is uh, zone uh, 5B or, or warmer. So it can take uh, a fair amount of cold. It has kind of uh, round or oval leaves that have really great golden fall color. And then in the early spring before the leaves come out, uh, the stems are covered with small yellow flowers. So it's native, it uh, can grow in shade, it has yellow flowers in the spring and great uh, yellow fall color. I'd like to also cover a few Asian species. Uh, one of them is uh, called Lindira obtusa loba. So that means it has kind of big rounded lobes. And if you know what a sassafras looks like, some of the leaves can be entire, some can be kind of mitten shaped, and some can be uh, three lobed. And the same is true for uh, Lindira obtusa loba. So by having those kind of big, broad, rounded leaves of uh, different shapes, it provides a really bold textural effect in the garden. Also, in very early spring or late winter, it has a, a fairly good conspicuous flowering. So it has actually more robust flowers than the native counterpart, Lindira benzoin. It's also uh, reasonably hardy. I know uh, with some protection, it can grow in Chicago in zone 5B. And then the fall color, like the native Lindira, is exceptional. It has incredible golden yellow fall color. And then another Asian Lindira is Lindira uh, glauca, variety Slicifolia, uh, sometimes called Japanese Lindira or the narrow leafed Lindira. And this too, like uh, Lindira obtusilova and Lindira benzoin, is 100% deer resistant. I have it in my front yard where there's a lot of deer pressure. I've never, ever seen any deer browsing. It too has kind of yellowish flowers in the spring, but for this one, its main attribute is its narrow leaves. So it has more of a fine texture in landscape. And then those narrow leaves turn this incredible suffusion of yellow and a little bit of red, but really can be this incredible, true kind of pumpkin orange in the fall landscape. And then the leaves eventually fade to kind of a beige taupe color, and then they just hang on for the winter. So uh, that effect is great for uh, winter interests. It tends to be an upright multi-stem shrub and uh, I have it in multiple locations in my garden, some in, in which there's uh, a quite a bit of shade, but also can, uh, can also grow in uh, sunny conditions as well. So to recap, uh, Daphnophyllum, Trochodendron, Mahonia are all broadleafed evergreens, and then the Lindiras, Lindira benzoin, Lindira obtusa loba, and Lindira glauca variety salicifolia are all uh, deciduous shrubs. So speaking of Swarthmore, pretty interesting that our expert testimony was from the former director of Swarthmore Arboretum, right? Or well, it's, it's the Scott Arboretum on the Swarthmore 
College campus. There we go. There we go. But he didn't mention Edgeworthia. Should have asked him about it. Well, he didn't need to. You spoke for him. That's true. 